It is now time for oral questions. Okay. I, I'm sorry I didn't see her. I didn't hear her say point of order. Thank you for drawing it to my attention. I recognize the Associate Minister of Social <coughs> and Economic Development. Well, Speaker, thank you. I seek unanimous consent of the House for members to be permitted to wear purple scarves in honour of International Women's Day. The Minister is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to allow members to wear purple scarves today in honour of International Women's Day. Agreed. Agreed. We're ready to start question period. I recognize the leader of Her Majesty, His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning. Good morning, Speaker. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, everything old is new again. Just over 10 years ago, the official opposition discovered that the government had been using code words to, to cover up misconduct. That was the Liberal government, and they were found to be using the term Project Vapor, Speaker, as code for their gas plant cover-up. Now we know that the current government also used code terms like G-Star and Special Project to cover their tracks on the Greenbelt grab. So my question to the Premier is, is Special Project G-Star this government's Project Vapor? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, I think uh, the Integrity Commissioner uh, has, uh, uh, has addressed that, and I think I've addressed that on a number of occasions in the House. The supplementary question. <sighs> okay. Um, thank you, Speaker. The Integrity Commissioner said Ryan Amato identified Patrick Sackville, who is now the Premier's current Chief of Staff, as the decision-maker in the Premier's office for the Greenbelt, quote, special project. We have emails with special project in the subject line sent between Mr. Amato and Mr. Sackville, and it is clearly the $8 billion Greenbelt scheme. They sent emails with details about the scheme, like removal criteria, Speaker, but they never actually say the words Greenbelt. So my question to the Premier again, I think the people of Ontario would deserve a response from the Premier himself. Did anyone in the Premier's office direct that government officials avoid or destroy any paper trail that could expose their Greenbelt discussions? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Again, Mr. Speaker, I think the Integrity Commissioner has addressed that, as has the, uh, uh, the Auditor General, and I've answered that question on a number of cases in the House. The final supplementary. Uh, well, Speaker, I understand why the government doesn't want to address these questions, but the people of Ontario deserve answers. It's a question of integrity. It's a question of accountability. The use of code terms is evidence of intent to conceal. Someone was trying to cover their tracks, and that's not all. The Auditor General found that political staffers were not just deleting emails related to the Greenbelt, they were also using their own personal emails to avoid detection. The Premier himself conducts government business on his personal phone, but refuses to disclose his phone records as required by law. When the Liberal government got caught covering up a scandal during Project Vapor, someone went to jail. And guess what? It was the Premier's chief of staff. Question. Why is the Premier following the Liberal government down the same path of code words, cover-ups and criminal investigations? Members will please take their seats. Seek Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, if the Leader of the Opposition has additional information that she would like to share with uh, the Integrity Commissioner, I invite her to do so. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, don't worry. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. Uh, Speaker, we spend a lot of time in here talking about this government scandals, uh, the green belt grab, the cover-up, G-Star, the RCMP criminal investigation of this government, but one of the biggest scandals in this province is the fact that more than 2.2 million Ontarians don't have a primary care doctor. The health of Ontarians is at risk, and that risk increases with every single passing day that this government fails to deliver. So my question to the Premier is, exactly how long will he keep people waiting for a doctor? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. 
very much, Speaker. You know, I love these questions because it gives me an opportunity to talk about the investments that our government, under Premier sure, Ford, sure. have been able to make in primary care multidisciplinary teams. <laughs> Seventy-eight new or expanded primary care teams, multidisciplinary teams, which means doctors working with nurse practitioners, working with nurses, with dietitians, with mental health workers. It is historic that we have seen this investment. And respectfully, Speaker, the investments Carter. are happening across Ontario. 78 different teams in Toronto, in Ottawa, in Aurelia. Where we see the need, we have made those investments, a tripling of the investment that we announced Response. under our Your Health Plan. I remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary question. To make these issues sound complicated, but healthcare workers have been offering up a simple solution for years, and I really hope that the Premier is listening to this. Doctors say they can take on an additional 2 million patients. 2 million if someone else could handle the paperwork. You heard that right. We can cut down the primary care wait list by 90 per cent, Speaker, if the government would help get this paperwork off doctors' desks. So my question to the Premier is, why is this Premier letting paperwork stand between doctors and patients? The Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, we have an ongoing regular conversation and a committee with the Ontario Medical Association to talk specifically about where there are opportunities for different uh, clinicians to be able to do some of the, the necessary and needed paperwork that is part of serving our patients. But having said that, we've already made changes. You know, the expanded scope of practice that we have announced and embarked on, particularly in uh, pharmacies. We now have over 800,000 people who are accessing their local community pharmacists to deal with minor ailments. Those are changes that our government has been able to put in working with our partners. We've expanded scope of practice for nurse practitioners. We've expanded scope of practice for RNs. And we continue to do that work because Response. we know people need to be able to see the appropriate clinician depending on the issues and illnesses that they're dealing with. Thank you, Speaker. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Minister, doctors are leaving the system faster than anyone can recruit them because of this exact issue. Doctors should be spending their time with patients, not with paperwork. Why does the government continue to complicate this issue? Doctors are spending 19 hours per week on administrative tasks. If they could spend that time with patients instead, it would be like adding 2,000 more doctors. That would reduce the primary care wait list by 90 per cent, Speaker. A practical solution, a simple solution. Why won't the government get the paperwork off doctors' desks? Members will please take their seats. The Minister of Health. Where was the member opposite? Where was the party opposite when they were propping up the Liberals and they did nothing Not to prevent the Jay. Liberal government Order. at the time to cut 50 residency positions in the province You're of Ontario? Patient. Imagine, Speaker, how Order. many more physicians we would have practicing in the Mr. province Mr. of Ontario Not if the Liberal Dr. government Parker. hadn't cut those 50 positions. Order. Speaker, Numbers matter. It would have been over 200 new physicians in the wow. province of Ontario. Oh. We are actively working wow. with our partners, like the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. A single ministerial directive letter ensured that internationally educated graduates who are waiting and want to practice in the province of Ontario have that opportunity. The direction was quickly assess, review, and when appropriate, license people who are waiting to practice Response. in the province of Ontario. We'll continue to get the work done. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetnaw. Uh, miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, good morning. Uh, speaker, uh, last weekend, a nursing station uh, in Cat Lake burnt down. This is a letter from um, ten -year -old, uh, a 10-year-old worried about his access to health care. Dear Saul Mamakwa, MPP, I am 10 years old and I am from Cat Lake First Nation. Our health clinic 
burned down this past weekend. We need your help. I feel sick as I write this. Please take this seriously and get us help. Bryson Wesley, Cat Lake. To the Premier, will you make sure Bryson and Cat Lake have the access to health care that they need? Members will please take their seats. To reply, the member for Thunder Bay Atacokan and Parliamentary Assistant. Speaker, we are deeply saddened to hear about the fire at the Cat Lake Nursing Station. Minister Rickford has reached out to Cat Lake First Nation Chief Russell Wesley to reassure him and the community of Cat Lake that our government will be there to support them. We remain in contact with Cat Lake leadership as the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre carries out their work. Our government stands with the families and community members of Cat Lake and is mobilizing quickly to ensure supports are available. <clears throat> nurses are still in the community and working out of the MNR building. Additional nurses and emergency medical equipment have already been sent to the community. We continue to monitor the situation and we will continue to work with community members, partners to, in Cat Lake to address this tragic situation. Thank you. And the supplementary, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. Access to health care is the responsibility of the Minister of Health. Yep. For decades, residents of Cat Lake had access to excellent nurses and nurse practitioners, but their nursing station burnt down. They cannot just go to the nearest walk-in clinic. This is a first, this is a flying First Nation community. They have no access to care. Is the Minister of Health going to simply abandon? The 650 residents of Cat Lake, like the 2.2 million Ontarians that do not have access to family physician. And to respond, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, when I had my conversation with Grand Chief Fiddler on Sunday morning, it was deeply disturbing to hear about the fire in Cat Lake, and I immediately made a phone call to the federal minister, Mark Holland, to share how we can work together to make sure that the citizens of Cat Lake are protected and continue to provide health care. There is no doubt when these catastrophic events happen that we all need to work together. And the member opposite knows that this was a federal nursing station. We will absolutely be there as a provincial partner, but we have to make sure that all of us are working together for the people of Cat Lake. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Ooh. People in my riding of Bruce Gray Owen Sound are concerned about the harmful impacts of the federal carbon tax. That's right. So far, the federal <laughs> government has increased the carbon tax not once but five times, Shame. Speaker. Oh, and to make things even worse, they plan on increasing it another seven times what? by 2030. Oh, this gosh. is ridiculous. Since the implementation of this tax, Ontarians have been paying more and more every single day for food, for services, and for transportation. These dire effects are felt by our trucking industry, which serves a crucial role in transporting the goods we need in our daily lives. Speaker. Can the minister please further explain the impact of the federal carbon tax on Ontario's trucking industry? Yeah, good well, to reply, the Minister of Energy. Much, uh, Mr. Speaker, our Minister of Transportation has explained this on many occasions in the legislature, but I'm happy to join in the chorus of two-thirds of the people across Canada who are saying they cannot afford another increase to the carbon tax on April the 1st, a 23 per cent increase to the carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, our truckers are the ones that are out there delivering goods from the farm gate to the distribution centre to the grocery stores, and you wonder why the cost of everything is going up, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, you only have to look at one place. Justin and Jug Meats carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. It's making life unaffordable in the province of Ontario. 
the budget officer on Parliament Hill says people are paying more than they're getting back in these phony carbon rebates, Mr. Speaker. And the Bank of Canada has said that the carbon tax is also having a massive impact on the rise Response. that we've been experiencing in inflation, Mr. Speaker. In spite of all of this, our government is doing everything we can to ensure that life in Ontario is affordable for the people of Ontario. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. Speaker, it's not just truckers that are being adversely impacted by the carbon tax. It's all commuters. The rising cost of fuel is affecting individuals and families in every corner of our province. They should not have to be burdened with additional costs when it comes to driving to work or driving their kids to school. We know the people of Ontario deserve better. That's why our government will continue to keep costs down for Ontarians so they can keep their more money in their own pockets where it belongs. Speaker, can the minister explain what our government is doing to counteract the federal carbon tax and make life more affordable for Ontario commuters? The Minister of Energy. Again, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, is spot on. The carbon tax is driving up the price of everything across Canada. We're doing everything we can, Mr. Speaker. We've taken 10.7 cents off the price of a litre of gasoline, the Ontario gas tax. We've eliminated the tolls on our highways across Ontario, eliminated fees. We have eliminated license plate sticker fees. We have lowered taxes. And, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, one fair fan of that Gasolin here, he, uh, our minister, associate minister of transportation, <laughs> announced one fare for all transit riders in the GTHA, Mr. Speaker. That move alone by this minister is going to save commuters $1,600 a year, Mr. Speaker. Our government is taking action when it comes to making life more affordable. Response. Bonnie Crombie and the Liberals, the Ontario Liberal Party, are still supporting the federal carbon tax. It's un the next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Minister, during, 2020, during the 2022 provincial election, the minister said Perrin Park would be a priority as construction on the Eglinton Crosstown LRT extension takes place. In fact, I'll quote from a letter the minister wrote to the community. If elected as your representative at Queen's Park, I will be in the best position to bring your concerns forward to Metrolinx and will work with you directly on this issue." End quote. Speaker, members of Mount Dennis community are here today, and they haven't heard from their minister in two years, despite their countless appeals to get his ear and to have meetings. So my question is a simple one. Minister, why did you break your promise to your community? Thank you. Once again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House, to reply the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, here you have it again, absolute nimbyism everywhere you go. Anywhere this government is trying to build a project, Mr. Speaker, the NDP and the Liberals oppose every single That's thing that we are doing, NIMBY. Mr. Speaker. The Liberal, previous Liberal government, 15 years of absolute inaction in this province, doing absolutely nothing to build. And what does the NDP do when we're making record and historic investments of over $70 billion in the next 10 years? They're standing with those that want to protest and stop the building of transit in, their, in our communities across Ontario. The time to build is right now. Our government is getting shovels in the ground, and we will take no lessons from Everywhere. the NDP or the previous Liberal government that did absolutely nothing to build infrastructure in this province, Mr. Speaker. And that is why we are committed to building. $80 billion over the next 10 years in public transit, investing $30 billion, close to $30 Response. billion dollars in highways and roads across this province because the people of this province deserve it, and we'll get those shovels in the ground. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is back to the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism, and I hope that he will respond himself this time. According to his community, he is rarely seen at community events, and he has, has, and he has ignored Order. community appeals to protect Perrin Park. 
Our friends from Mount Dennis here today can affirm this is true. Mount Dennis residents face an opaque and arrogant Metrolinx bureaucracy that would rather rip up 1,500 trees and bulldoze parkland than listen to community concerns. Speaker, we can have great public transit and urban forests right here in Ontario, but we need leadership to help get that done. My question is back to the minister. Will you keep your promise and fight for the people of Mount Dennis, Minister of Multiculturalism and Citizenship? Thank you. Members will take their seats. Once again, I'll ask members to make their comments through the chair. The Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, there is no one that works harder in their communities than that member and the Minister of Multiculturalism. He's talking to residents every single day, Mr. Speaker. He's talking to the Order. people, the people that elected him in this riding to get transit built, Order. Mr. Speaker. Member for Ottawa Centre. We're not going to take lessons from the NDP or the Liberals that did nothing for 15 years when it came to building. Member for province. Ottawa Centre, come to order. We're getting the ground, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to let a group, a protest group, hold us up from getting. Member for Toronto St. Paul's will come to order. Five million cars off the road, Mr. Speaker. We're going to give. A reduction of 11,000 GHG emissions in this province, Mr. The member for Ottawa Centre perhaps didn't hear me. He will come to order. The member for Toronto St. Paul's perhaps didn't hear me. She will come to order. The Minister of Transportation has a few extra seconds to finish up his answer. Mr. Speaker, that line will have 60 percent faster service than the current bus service that that community has right now, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to build across this province because that is what we were elected to here, do, here. and that is why the Premier— Stop the clock. Stop the clock. We have with us in the Legislature a former member who was here for many years as the member for Leeds-Grenville, Bob Brunsman. Welcome back to the Legislature. Great to see you here. Your timing, as always, is perfect. Okay, so we've long had a convention in this House that we don't make reference to the absence of a member who might be away for any given reason from the House on any given day. It is not, a, a, I don't think it's a road we want to go down where we start to drawing attention to whether or not members are attending a sufficient number of community events. I think if we give that some thought, we'll uh, conclude that that's not a good road that, uh, that we want to go down. If we think it through. Start the clock. The next question. The member for Leeds Granville, Thousand Islands, and Greenville Lakes. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, Speaker my, uh, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation, and Trade. And I'm glad that uh, my predecessor, Senator Runciman, is here because I know he agrees with this question. <laughs> Speaker, there's fierce competition uh, across the globe to attack, att attract, retain skilled, talented workers. We know affordability issues are a big consideration when workers are deciding where they should call home. That's why, our, as a government, we've taken concrete action to do our part to lower costs for households. But unfortunately, the Liberals are proceeding with hiking their carbon tax on April 1st. Their carbon tax is going to see the price of gas increase by 37 cents a litre in 2030, while home heating costs skyrocket. And if they, it's almost like, Speaker, they're deliberately trying to hurt the pocketbooks of hardworking families and chase those talented workers out of our province. It's a shame that the Liberals in this House still support the carbon tax. Yeah. Speaker, can the minister yeah, please explain how the carbon tax hurts the Ontario Question. workers that are powering our economy? Here, here. <laughs> And to reply, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. We all know that the carbon tax is a tax on every single family, on every single worker in Ontario. 
And speaker, we have the best talent pool in the world. We're better educated than any OECD country. 71 percent of Ontarians have a post-secondary degree. 70,000 annual STEM grads, speaker, 420,000 tech workers, 100,000 auto workers, 85,000 AI workers, 72,000 life science workers. Our economy needs these workers, speaker, but the carbon tax hurts them, and the carbon tax tax risks chasing all of them away. Speaker, we need to ax the tax. Here, here. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Back to the minister. Uh, I want to thank him for his answer. You know, Speaker, I think we can all agree that the talent we have in Ontario is second to none. Here, here. And as economies across the world grapple with aging populations that are exiting their workforce, the race for talent is going to heat up. It's never been more important for us to foster the conditions to retain and to attract skilled workers. That's why we've been so adamant as a government and our efforts to put more money back into the pockets of hardworking Ontario, Ontarians who have earned it. The Liberals want to do the opposite with their carbon tax. They want to take more money out of people's pockets with a carbon tax hike every single solitary year. We've never supported the Liberal tax grab, and I can assure everyone in this House that Question. under the leadership of Premier Ford, we will never support the carbon tax. Yeah. Speaker, can the minister please highlight how the carbon tax jeopardizes the progress that we've made in key sectors? The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. S Speaker, the Liberal carbon tax comes up in every corner of the world. And despite this tax, we've still been able to land $28 billion in auto and EV. Bloomberg now ranks us as number one in the global EV battery rankings. We've had $3 billion in life sciences, tens of billions of dollars in tech. Companies are investing in Ontario because we've reduced the cost of doing business. We've lowered taxes. We've shown the Liberals that lower taxes equal higher jobs. 700,000 jobs have been created in Ontario because we lowered taxes, Speaker. The Liberals need to stop making it harder for these companies to expand and to grow. They need to scrap the tax today. Scrap it. Thank you very much. The next question, a member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Yan Pingyi lives in the Chinatown area and she doesn't have a family doctor. After not sleeping and feeling dizzy for four days, she had no choice but to go to the Toronto Western Emergency Room, one of the busiest hospitals in Ontario. Yan waited seven hours overnight, but eventually left without a prescription or help because there was no one in the emergency room who spoke Cantonese or Mandarin, and Yan is not fluent in English. Minister, do you think it's acceptable that thousands of people in the Chinatown area have to go to an emergency room for non-urgent care because they don't have access to a family doctor? Minister of Health. Well, Speaker, with the greatest of respect, where was the member when we were increasing scope of practice for pharmacies to ensure that people who did not have to access emergency departments as their only option had the opportunity to visit their local community pharmacy? 800,000 people since that policy was brought into place in January of 2023 have accessed that service. It's critically important. And I look at all the investments that we are making in the Toronto region, uh, specifically related Order. to the primary care expansion. $110 million, Speaker, that we're increasing access to primary care. We are getting it done by making the investments very strategically to ensure people get access to care. The supplementary question. Minister, Yan went to her pharmacist, and it was her pharmacist that told her they were not able to give her a prescription. That's how we found out about this issue. The family doctor shortage in Toronto is, get, is bad, and it is getting worse. In Chinatown, five doctors have already retired, and two more are about to retire, which means over 7,000 people are going to be without a family doctor. I am worried that this government is driving the primary health care system into the ground. 
Minister, what is your plan to address the worsening family doctor and primary care provider shortage in underserved areas like Chinatown? Minister of Health. Plan is working, and we've already announced it. Davenport, Perth, Neighbourhood Community Order. Health Centre, yeah. Expansion, Order. Sherborne Health Care Centre, St. Michael's Academic and a Family Health Team, Expansion, House Call Sprint Senior Care, Expansion and New Mobile, Unison Health and Community Service, Expansion and New Mobile, West Toronto, CHS. It goes on and on, Speaker. When we make investments of $110 million to make sure that we have sufficient primary care access in the province of Ontario, this member and this party votes against it. That's what we are seeing in this government. The next question, the member for Canada Carleton. Thank you, Speaker. This government is relentless. If there isn't a ready-made opportunity, they will create a way to insert their friends and insiders into every public good in Ontario. They did it with the Green Belt, they did it with Ontario Place, they did it with Service Ontario, and now they're putting their own former Conservative staffers into the judicial system. My question is for the Premier. How can Ontarians trust a court that has been overtly and intentionally poisoned with blatant political bias? Order. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I just want to cast back the last year to the member from Oakville North Burlington when she brought a motion forward uh, on Kira's Law, yeah. saying that we should require the judges take mandatory training as they come to the bench, and JPs take mandatory training as they take their position on sexual assault and, and sexual violence, Mr. Speaker. And you know what happened with that motion? It was unanimously supported by this House, Mr. Speaker. And when we, when we then incorporated Kira's Law into, uh, into Strengthening Safety and Modernizing Justice Act 2023, Mr. Speaker, everybody in the House spoke in favour of that piece of the legislation, Mr. Speaker. Now, when we talk about diversity and we want to increase the diversity of the bench, people say, absolutely, you need to do that. And when we talk about raising awareness of victims' perspectives and Response. issues, people say, absolutely, Mr. Speaker. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, you know where this is going. Because when we say we want to have tough on crime judges and JPs, the House says, oh, no, 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 we can't, we can't have a perspective, Mr. Speaker. Well, we do have a perspective. Order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The new chair of our Judicial Appointments Advisory Committee is not only a former Conservative staffer, he is also Order. a registered lobbyist for Colt Manufacturing, the manufacturing of the notorious AR-15. The families of this province are looking for tighter gun controls, not an industry friend meddling with our judges. Trust in our judicial system is absolutely key to the functioning of our democracy. One only needs to look to our neighbours to the south to see where the politicization of justice leads. How could the Attorney General possibly think Order. that this overt and blatant politicization of our judicial Question. system won't erode that trust, unless that is the end game? Order. Order. To reply, the Premier. Well, well Mr. Speaker, let, let's just go back 15 years. The Liberal government was the weakest government when it came to crime. They're okay. They're okay with people kicking the doors in, Order. putting guns to people's heads, asking for their keys, terrifying the neighborhood, terrifying Order. the people. But we're seeing it everywhere. And guess what happens, Mr. Speaker? They get out on bail the next day to go and do the do it again. And then what happens? They go out on bail again. Well, my great the city community up there that I absolutely love. They're being extorted. 
because these people are threatening their families, shooting up the streets if they don't pay money. But guess what? When we catch the people, they get out on bail, and then they get targeted again. You know, everywhere I go, Mr. Speaker, I'm hearing one thing. Keep going. Make sure you appoint judges that are tough on crime, that are going to throw the criminals in jail, that are terrorizing our neighbourhoods. Okay. The next question, the member Porter. The next question, the member for Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. When I speak to my residents in the Great Riding of Newmarket Aurora, they continue to express their top concern, which is over the ever-escalating costs of living. At a time when all communities need to be supported, the federal government continues to penalize the people of Ontario by hiking the carbon tax. Oh, shame. As our parents and grandparents age, the cost of building long-term care homes remain high, and the carbon tax is making it worse. Seniors help build our province, That's and our government must ensure that they continue to receive the quality of care and the quality of life that they need and deserve in a long-term care home. Question. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House what our government is doing to protect Ontario families, especially our seniors, from the negative impact of the carbon tax? The Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, so, Speaker, the member is absolutely right. Seniors did build this province and our community. So, happy International Women's Day to the many women seniors who live in our long term care homes. Thank you for everything that you've done. I hear that concern the member uh, raises every day in Willowdale. It's exactly why our government embarked on a historic plan, a historic plan led by this Premier to build. 58,000 new and upgraded spaces, the most aggressive capital plan in this country's history. But there are challenges, Speaker. And one of the biggest challenges is the cost of doing business and building. Mm -hmm. A cost, Speaker, that will rise thanks to the federal Liberals' carbon tax 23 per cent in the very near future. Now, our government is fighting to keep costs low, fighting to build Ontario. But right now, uh, when we are trying to build the homes for seniors to age and comfort and dignity, the carbon tax is Response. standing in the way. Every time we try and make it easier to build, the Liberals and the NDP get in the way. I challenge them to stand up and do the right thing. Let's scrap. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. Speaker, the carbon tax is increasing the price of everything, including building, material, and transport. And as the Minister just said, come April 1st, it's going to get more expensive with another 23% increase to that carbon tax. This has, is, and will impact construction costs in our province. While our government has been speaking out against the carbon tax day, since day one, the opposition NDP and the independent Liberals continue to ignore the harmful impact this tax is having on Ontario families. Despite the inaction and the lack of the sense of urgency Order. from the opposition, we we will continue to uphold our commitment to seniors in Ontario Question. and ensure we build homes in the communities they help build. Speaker, can the minister please further explain how the carbon tax is affecting the long-term care sector? Minister of Long-Term Care. Oh, isn't it unbelievable, Speaker? While the member is addressing such an important issue that's affecting our seniors in long-term care homes, you have the members from the NDP heckling the question and saying, get over it, as if the carbon tax isn't affecting the daily lives of those who built our communities. Shame on them, Speaker, because we believe that the most vulnerable deserve a place to call home. Speaker, unfortunately, the Liberals, led by the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, wants to do what she did in Mississauga. She wants to stop building everywhere. Now, I've heard from workers, I've heard from lenders, I've heard from the operators, and they are saying this tax on everything is costing Ontario's long-term care Member sector. It costs Mount more to build. Order. It costs more to take care of our seniors. It, it costs more to get equipment to our seniors. Costs have risen 30 per cent in only five years. This Premier will continue to fight for the hard-working people, the seniors who built our communities. We're not taking any lessons from the heckle party over there. We're getting it done. Stop the clock. Member 
also please take those two. Order. The House will come to order so we can continue with question period. Thank you. Start the clock. The member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. For years, the Ontario Medical Association has been sounding the alarm on the shortage of doctors in this province. In Kitchener, there are currently 55 open physician positions on the provincial recruitment program. The KW Chamber of Commerce has said, and I quote, there are somewhere between 60,000 and 70,000 people in Waterloo Region right now who do not have a doctor. Kitchener uh, is not alone. There are 2.2 million Ontarians who do not have a family doctor, and that number is going to surge to 4.4 million by 2026. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Health, when will this government prioritize the patients and families waiting for care in Waterloo Region? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Everything that our government is doing is prioritizing the patient. Whether it is expanding scope of practice for clinicians who are already trained and ready to step up and do additional work like pharmacists, like nurse practitioners, like registered nurses, we are working directly with them. And I would say, you know, when we have historic investments of $110 million in 78 primary care expansions, including one in the member's own region of a nurse practitioner-led clinic, we are making those investments. Will the member opposite stand up, support those expansions, support that nurse practitioner-led clinic that is going to be able to expand and offer new services and additional patients in your region? Speaker, it is so very clear that your plan is not working. Every Ontarian is feeling the pain of your incompetence. Speaker, a shortage of doctors causes more people to visit the emergency room, increasing Order. wait times and putting further financial strain on this already Order. overburdened health care. And KW is not alone, Speaker. There are currently 32,000 people in Peterborough alone without a family doctor, another 28,000 in Kingston, another 10,000 in Sault Ste. Marie. The conser this Conservative government is failing to provide Ontarians with access to primary care that they definitely deserve. Back to the Minister of Health. When will this government finally address the crisis in Ontario and the 2.2 million people who do not have access to a family doctor? To respond, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, to the member across the aisle, why does she always vote about the increase of $20 billion more we're spending on health care compared to when they were in power? Why did she vote against the 10,800 more doctors that are working now than they were five years ago? Why did she vote against the 80,000 new nurses that have registered to work in Ontario, 17,000 alone? Why did you Order. vote against the medical universities that were building capacity in Brampton and in Scarborough and up north? Why did she vote for the more grads and undergrads that that party under the Liberals with the support of the NDP cut seats. I'm just wondering, she votes against health care. We're making health care a lot better than it was five years ago, Mr. Speaker. We're going to increase, continue increasing the spend when it comes to health care, but obviously you don't care because you vote against every. Thank you. Thank you. And once again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Solicitor General. Speaker, in 2023, Toronto recorded close, four, close to 4,000 residential breaks in, a 30% increase from 2022. Torontonians are anxious about the rise of crime and its tra traumatic effects on victims who are left feeling vulnerable and violated when they deserve to feel safe in the private sanctuary of their homes. 
Speaker, people are also frustrated that convicted criminals save their time in jail only to resurface in the community to the orphan. The demand immediate action in establishing successful deterrence Question. to crime, from the certainty of being caught to the consequences imposed upon criminals. Speaker, can the Solicitor General explain this government's approach to deter the crimes? Thank you. Order. The Solicitor General can reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is right. People have a right to be concerned about their safety. And public safety for this government is a top priority. And let me say this, Mr. Speaker. Just recently, when police service budgets had to get approved in Toronto, in Hamilton, and in London, proxies for the Liberal Party and the NDP voted no. They do not stand as we do, having the backs every day of our police services. And we are not going to live and, and accept the fact that people can commit violent crimes on our streets and be back the next day. This is unacceptable. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to advocate to the federal government, move past C-48, which was a good first step, do more so that we can keep our province safe. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you so much to the Solicitor General for his response. Speaker, punishment alone may be viewed as an appropriate deterrent, but long-term solution inclusion, include the rehabilitation of criminals to motivate them to become contributing members of society. It is essential that criminals receive job training to equip them with the skills they need to work for their living rather than surviving by exploiting others. Speaker, can the Solicitor General tell this House what steps is this government taking to break the cycle of opportunistic crime in our communities? Thank you. The Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Community reintegration is very important, and we will continue to have the backs of our correctional, our probation, and our parole officers every day for the work that they do so that when a person is reintegrated back to the communities, it is done so safely. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to go back again. When a person is confronted with their doors being knocked in, and when they are demanded to turn over the keys, when people don't feel safe, when our seniors don't feel safe, something is wrong. And that's why our government will always prioritize public safety, fighting auto theft with over $51 million, fighting to keep these violent and repeat offenders off our streets with an investment of over $112 million, and putting more Response. boots on the ground so that we all over Ontario can feel safe. Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Reliable high-speed internet is key to building a stronger Ontario. People across the province depend on high-speed internet for education, health services, business operation, and to stay connected with their loved ones. Unfortunately, under the previous Liberal government, ignored many rural, remote, and northern communities when it came to making investments into critical infrastructure. Unlike the Liberals, our government has made it a priority to bring high-speed internet to every community in the province by the end of 2025. While significant work is already underway to improve and expand broadband services, we must continue to build on the progress we have made and ensure our rural and northern communities are connected. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House what our government is doing to bring high-speed internet access to all communities across Ontario? The Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and of course, thank you very much to the hardworking member. Mr. Speaker, we were re-elected to build Ontario, and part of that commitment is making sure that everyone has access to high-speed internet. Mr. Speaker, our goal was to connect everyone by the end of 2025. We've, we have allocated $4 billion. We have invested $2.4 billion for 200 projects across this province. And Mr. Speaker, I'm really happy to provide an update. As you all know, we executed on the reverse auction last year where we took lots that were not connected, we put it out to the market, 
and through that reverse auction, we intend on connecting 266,000 premises. Mr. Speaker, I'm really pleased to say that White River in Northern Ontario it ha now has access to high-speed internet thanks to the Premier's leadership in making sure that everyone is connected by the end of 2025. Mr. Speaker, this is really important Spons. because this just proves how important connecting Northern communities is to our government, and we will get the job done. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It is encouraging to see our government continue to make historic investments to expand reliable, high-speed internet across all of Ontario. These investments will make life more convenient for families and businesses in my riding of Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, and all across our province. Speaker, rural and remote communities have traditionally identified more connectivity challenges. We know that access to reliable high-speed internet is a necessity, not a luxury. That's why our government must continue to strengthen communities and deliver on our promise to build broadband infrastructure. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is improving connectivity across Ontario so that no community is left behind? The Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you much. Uh, to the member, I know how important this is. To the member's own riding, Mr. Speaker, given the size and the topography of Ontario, we knew that in order to connect every single household in the province of Ontario, we would have to explore all different types of techno technology and look at innovative solutions. Mr. Speaker, to close the gaps, we are exploring satellite technology. In fact, on behalf of the province of Ontario, Infrastructure Ontario has led and new procurement. They have now narrowed it down to two satellite providers, and in the summer, we will announce the satellite provider that will connect the remaining 43,000 premises. Mr. Speaker, these are the hardest to reach places. These are the remote communities. These are the municipalities that are surrounded by rock. And Mr. Speaker, every option was explored, Response. and we are on our way to connect every home by the end of 2025. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Niagara is a senior community with higher health needs, so it is concerning that our family doctor's crisis is blooming from bad to worse. Since June, residents in Niagara have been without a family doctor, have grown from 53,000 to 73,000. That number is expected to double by 2026. St. Catharines alone needs 51 doctors right now. Family physicians' alarm bell wasn't just rung, it is blaring. Despite promises, St. Catharines health teams see no base funding boost to support our already stretched aging doctors. They are overworked, underpaid, and buried in red tape. When will you halt Question. the doctor drain and prioritize St. Catharines and seniors across Niagara? I ask the members to make their comments through the chair once again. Minister of Health. Speaker, you will know that we have made considerable investments in the Niagara region, not, of course, uh, without a lot of advocacy from um, the uh, member from Niagara West, Sam, Mr. Hawk. It's, uh, you know, it, is, it is very exciting to see the expansion, the build, the ground banking, which, by the way, your member that you sit beside actually attended and acknowledged was great news for South Niagara with the, the uh, South Niagara Hospital. A, a multi-million dollar investment Order. in the Niagara region. Um, the member opposite continues to ignore the fact that as we make those expansions, as we ensure Order. that through a $110 million investment in primary care expansion, which by the way, facts Spons. matter, includes an increase to the base of the existing health care teams. Thank you, Speaker. The supplementary question, member for Hamilton West, Ancaster, Dundas. Minister, facts matter. 2.2 million Ontarians do not have a family doctor in this province, despite right. all of your spin. Right. Family medicine is the backbone of our health system. Without access to doctors, we miss important early detection of cancers. Diabetics risk losing their vision without treatment, and families and women go without critical, maternal, and prenatal care. Right now, 60,000 people in Hamilton don't have a family doctor, and that is expected to double in just two short years. So my question 
How long is this go Conservative government going to stand by and let people suffer? Minister of Health. So, to be clear, there are expansions in Hamilton with the Greater Hamilton Health Network and Primary Care Stakeholder Council. Is the member opposite going to support that investment? There are investments in the Order. Niagara Ontario Health Team, Bridges Order. Community Health Centre in partnership. The member for Hamilton, Hamilton West Family and Castor Dundas will come to order. Is the member opposite going to support those investments? These are historic multidisciplinary teams that are new and expanded across the province of Ontario. Is the member going to support those investments? Order. Because at the core, what we have is a health care system that was ignored for decades by the previous Liberal government. We are Response. making those changes. We've already announced these expansions. Now all you have to do is tell your community you're going to— The member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas and the member for St. Catharines will come to order. The member for Kitchener Conestoga. Next question. The question is to the Associate Minister of Transportation. Since the federal government imposed the carbon tax, people in Ontario have been paying more for everything. Residents in my riding of Kitchener Conestoga tell me that they are finding it more difficult to keep up with the rising cost of groceries and gas. Speaker, at a time when many Ontarians are already struggling with high inflation costs, they should not have to worry about being able to drive where they need to go. Unlike the opposition NDP and independent Liberals, our government will continue to advocate for Ontarians and ask the federal Liberals to put an end to the carbon tax. Yeah. Speaker, can the minister please explain what impact the carbon tax is having on transportation needs of Ontario families? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kitchener Conestoga for that question and for his advocacy against carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, the member is right. The federal carbon tax is making life more expensive for people of Ontario, and especially forcing parents to unnecessary cause when they're driving to work, when they're driving their children to school, even for extracurricular activities, Mr. Speaker. And that is why I'm proud, under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government continues to oppose this harmful carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the Liberals and NDP are so out of touch that they are happy to support carbon tax that only hurts individuals and families throughout Ontario, Mr. Speaker. They are keeping they're doing, keep doing what they're doing best, Mr. Speaker. They are saying no to any measures that provides financial relief to Ontarians. Speaker, they said no to 418 and 412 uh, toll zones, Mr. Speaker. They don't want commuters to save $300 on 418 toll, and they don't want $150 saving on 412 tolls, Mr. Speaker. Our government will continue to stand up to keep costs down so that Ontarians can keep more money in their pockets where it blocks. That's a good okay. place for it. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the uh, Associate Minister for that answer. And I will say it is disappointing that the opposition NDP and independent Liberals continue, and I will say continue, to ignore their constituents and support a tax that only hurts the hardworking people of Ontario. The reality is that the carbon tax is leading to soaring fuel prices that makes life unaffordable and difficult for everyone. And Mr. Speaker, if you can believe it, the federal Liberals are planning on raising this tax 23 per cent on April 1st. It's a cruel joke, Speaker. We know that cancelling this unnecessary cost will deliver more affordability for Ontario drivers and put more money back into their pockets. And that's why our government will continue to call on the federal Liberals to get rid of the carbon tax. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is making life more affordable for Ontarians while we continue to fight this awful tax. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Drivers across our province want federal Liberals to get rid of this carbon tax. The carbon tax only serves to punish individuals and families in Ontario by driving the cost up for food, 
transit and everyday essential, Mr. Speaker. Our government continues to fight this adverse effects of the carbon tax by finding more ways to provide financial relief for the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That is why, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we eliminated license plate renewal fees, Mr. Speaker. As a result of this initiative, over $2.2 billion went back directly to the pockets of people, of 7 million hardworking people in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, whether it's removing fees or eliminating tolls or eliminating double fare with one fare program, we will continue to fight to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. Next question, member for Ottawa West Mackey. Thank you, Speaker. Far too many of my constituents are going without health care because Ottawa is short 171 family doctors. Ottawa residents who are sick, anxious about symptoms, or even simply looking to renew a prescription are forced to turn to the Queensway Carleton Hospital, one of the busiest emergency departments in the province. But this government cut funding for emergency care at the Queensway Carleton, meaning that by April there will be 10 fewer hours of physician coverage in the ER every single day. Why does the Minister of Health think people in Ottawa should have to wait hours in an overstretched ER just to receive basic health care. Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it is exactly why we have put programs in place, like the dedicated offload nursing program that ensures that a respiratory attack, a, a paramedic or a registered nurse can actually make sure and work as a team with the paramedics to make sure that they can go back out into the community and continue their work. That program alone has seen amazing results. In the city of Guelph, as an example, we saw decreases of almost 80% and in terms of the wait times for individuals who go into emergency departments. And I was able to speak to the mayor uh, earlier today to talk about how that one program has impacted their community in a very positive way. Can we do more? Absolutely. And we will continue to do more. You know, I think it's really important for the member opposite to understand that these programs have been built with the input Spons. of our agencies, whether that is hospitals, whether that is nurses like um, the uh, College of Nurses or the RPNO, um, with paramedics to make sure that the programs we put in place are actually impacting our communities in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the minister's plan is clearly not working because offload delays are so bad in the city of Ottawa that the government is looking at creating a pilot project to call taxis. So oh. dial 911, have Blue Line show up at your house instead of an ambulance. The minister is expanding funding for primary care, but only a small proportion of the clinics in Ontario that have actually asked for funding and support to expand. And people in Ottawa still don't know when or if their local primary clinic is one of the clinics that will get funding because the government is refusing to share how they're deciding which proposals to fund and who will actually get funding. When will this government actually support the people of Ottawa instead of leaving them in the dark? And the Minister of Health. No, when I have conversations with Mayor Sutcliffe, he talks about how the innovation that is happening at the Ottawa Hospital and in his community is making a positive impact in the city of Ottawa and the region. You know, I have to give credit where credit is due. Mayor Sutcliffe and his council voted to expand the number of paramedics and the number of uh, paramedic services that are being offered in the city of Ottawa. We, of course, as the province of Ontario, will be there as a 50% funding partner. We always have been and we always will. But we are working with our partners. We're not opposing the innovation and the changes that they want to make for, bring forward to make sure that we have appropriate health care in our communities closer to home. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.